Uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening for this public public seminar. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Clark. I'm the graduate convener here at the National Security College. Um, my role this evening is just to introduce our our uh, speaker, Associate Professor Sarah Percy, um, and I think she's going to give you a very interesting uh, and very rich presentation uh, on something that I think fits very well with the multidisciplinary focus and approach of the National Security College to national security challenges. And in particular, I think uh, Sarah's work addresses the nexus of the theory and practice of national security policy, and in particular, the uh, changing nature of national security challenges in the current landscape, and in particular, the intersection and convergence of traditional and non-traditional security challenges and threats. Um, uh, Sarah is currently Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Queensland and the Deputy Director of UQ's Graduate Centre for Governance and International Affairs. Uh, she's also a non-resident fellow of the Australian Sea Power Centre and a senior research associate at the Oxford Program on the Changing Character of War. Uh, before uh, going to the University of Queensland, she was an associate professor in international relations at the University of Western Australia. Her research focuses on unconventional combatants, particularly private military uh, and security companies and mercenaries and unconventional security threats, particularly in the maritime sphere. And she's presented on these topics at a range of, of academic venues, uh, as well as the United Nations and the Royal Navy and the Royal Australian Navy. Uh, finally, her research on piracy was also featured in the production notes of the film Captain Phillips, which starred Tom Hanks. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like you to welcome uh, Dr. Percy uh, uh, to present uh, her, her talk this evening. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. I always have to mention that because it's the closest I think I'll ever get to Tom Hanks. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having me here this evening. I very much appreciate the invitation and I'm always very happy to talk to audiences about some of the more policy-oriented research that I do. Um, I've had the sort of day where technology has conspired against me, so do not be surprised if something blows up during the course of the presentation. And I have my lovely and talented assistant over here who will be changing my slides for me, so uh, that might slow, slow things down a little bit. So can I have the first slide, please, Chris? So most of my research has always started with puzzles, something that surprises us that we should find unexpected about the study of international relations. And can I have the next one? In this particular case, one of the things we know is that states engage in extensive multilateral military cooperation. In fact, most states these days, most of the time, if they're operating in a military fashion, they're doing it with other states. They're doing it multilaterally. Unilateral military engagement is relatively rare, particularly among Anglo-Western states like Australia, the UK, Canada, the US. And one of the things which is really interesting about it, I'm going to give you the next one, is that the reason why they do this is pretty, seems to be pretty obvious, is that you need to do it for legitimacy. Very often it's very hard to undertake um, interventions without the sort of imprimatur that legitimacy gives you. And I think the US intervention in Iraq demonstrates those people really want to develop a coalition, not necessarily because it's going to give you any specific military benefit, but because that coalition gives you greater legitimacy. Um, and also there are, force, there are some force multiplier effects, particularly for some smaller states, that it would be hard to engage in military interventions if you didn't have some kind of coalition or cooperative venture. The problem with this, though, is that military cooperation is notoriously problematic. And when you talk to people about it and you say, well, you know, I know you felt that you had to develop this coalition. How was it working through the coalition? Most often they'll say it was terrible. You know, we had people who were operating under different rules, we had people who interpreted the rules differently, it caused an enormous amount of stress. So given that military cooperation is notoriously problematic, and given that it's not necessarily the optimum choice in many ways, can I have the next one? We've got lots of quotes like this. So dealing with the enemy is a simple and straightforward matter, and also like the next one. So this is sort of where my puzzle started is we expect that when people create multinational military cooperation, if that force multiplier stuff that I mentioned is true, what you should have is you should have something which is greater than the sum of its parts. But Nora Bensalo's US-based academic points out that this is often the reverse is true, that what you end up with is, is maybe less effective than operating on your own. And the reasons for this is multiple different types of military groupings operating together creates lots of points of friction. There are lots of points where things don't work together as well as they should. 
There are issues always with command and control. So who's in overall charge of the mission? How do you respond to the person in charge? How do people participate in the mission? And there's a general loss of efficiency, which goes, goes along with uh, multinational military operations. One of the specific areas we've seen this, and there's been some very interesting new research done on this, is in the idea of caveats, which is to say, yes, I'll come participate in your military force, but I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do this. And there's a very interesting paper that I can tell you more about in questions about particularly the impact on Germany of the use of these caveats in the ISAF context in Afghanistan, where there's been a lot of discussion about the damage that's done to Germany's reputation as an international military partner because their caveats were so strict. So how do we solve these problems with multinational military cooperation? Well, the traditional solution has been to assume that what you want to get, ideally, is something like World War II, where the, really there is somebody in charge. You have a very top-down military command. You have as few different multinational commands as possible. You streamline all of your multinational commands. And you have extremely hierarchical command. So there is no doubt as to who's giving the orders and when they're giving them. And that should, therefore, reduce the problems that we've talked about of friction and efficiency and things like that. But Given what we know about multinational cooperation and all of the things that make it work, my puzzle was this. How do we explain counterpiracy? Counterpiracy has been a very effective form of multinational military cooperation. So pirate attack, which was very, very high in 2008, 2009, there hasn't been a successful attack since 2014. So how do we explain, if multinational military cooperation is so hard, how can we explain counterpiracy, which has a number of very unique characteristics? Oh, can you go, sorry, go back to that one? <laughs> which has a number of very unique characteristics, and I'll come back to this idea in a minute. One of the things that makes counterpiracy so interesting is that it includes people who don't like each other in other contexts. So in counterpiracy, we have the Chinese cooperating with the Indians cooperating, with the Pakistanis cooperating, with the Americans, with the Australians. So, and in a way which is not at all hierarchical. So the question is, not only do we have a form of multinational military cooperation which seems to be effective, it bears no resemblance to that ideal type. What we really want is one person who's calling the shots from the top right down to the bottom. And we see this partly, this, um, it's always interesting talking to an audience like this because some of you I think will, will know exactly what I'm talking about and some of you this will be new. This is, um, this is SHADE, which is a shared awareness and deconfliction place which exists in Bahrain. And they meet to solve the problems of coordinating counterpiracy. And there you have the command structure of the multinational mission, which is running counterpiracy. And I'll come back to about how this works in a minute. But this facilitates multiple commands. It doesn't try to diminish them. And it's deliberately non-hierarchical. The idea is to get the most number of people you possibly can into this mechanism. And the only way you're going to do that is by not placing people under a hierarchy. And as I said, this includes both allies and foes and non-friends. So this is a Russian counterpiracy grouping. And Russia also helps participate in the broader counterpiracy missions in the Gulf of Aden. China is involved in this, as I've mentioned. And can we have the next one? And so then I came up with my more precise puzzle. So this is a um, subject of some research I've been doing for a while. And that is, how is counterpiracy different from other forms of military cooperation? So what is it that's making it work? And can we apply what has made counterpiracy work to other forms of military cooperation? Is there anything useful that we can draw from this? Or is counterpiracy just a completely unique beast from which we can't really draw any lessons? So that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about tonight. And I'm going to talk, I think, hopefully at multiple different levels, because I know some of the people in the room, as I said, will really have a great deal of familiarity with what I'm talking about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, for those of you who are interested in the study of international relations, there are some interesting international relations theoretical implications of what I'm talking about as well, but I'll do that with a very light touch. So we'll start out by thinking, what makes counterpiracy so different? The first thing is counterpiracy is a network. So this isn't a picture of the counterpiracy network. This is a picture of networks formed by human rights organizations. And the different, you can see how the lines connect things and the different sizes and shapes of the organizations indicate certain things about their importance within the network and how they're connected to other people. Network theory is a very, very trendy subject in international relations at the moment. We use network theory to describe all sorts of different things from networks of NGOs to networks of terrorists to networks of organized criminals. 
And it occurred to me, I was invited to join this project on network theory, which I knew nothing about before I started, because it occurred to me that actually counter piracy constitutes exactly this type of network. So what is networked cooperation? How do we define it? This is the textiest slide I will have for you. But it's basically actors who are working together, who are bound together by common values, common discourse, and dense exchanges of information and services. And the other way of looking at it is a form of organization characterized by voluntary, reciprocal, and horizontal patterns of communication and exchange. So basically, people participate in these on a voluntary basis. They work because they're reciprocal, because everybody's participating, and they work because they're horizontal. In other words, they're non-hierarchical. This is a very good depiction of counter piracy, and it's a bizarre depiction of military cooperation. So if you read that and said, I'm going to describe military co cooperation to you in this way, it makes absolutely no sense, except it works very well for counter piracy. So it doesn't resemble this traditional form of military cooperation. And as we'll find out, one of the things which is interesting about counter piracy is that it doesn't even really resemble some of these other networks that I've mentioned either. There are some unique things about it. So what's going on here, and what does it tell us about the prospects for cooperation in other areas? As I've said before, we can see the non-hierarchy working very well through this shared awareness and deconfliction exercise. Not every military grouping that's involved in counter piracy participates in SHADE, but most do, and even when they don't, they tend to have very close connections. What SHADE does is every time people have a problem, they bring it to these regularly organized meetings, and they try and work out exactly how they're going to move going forward. And it's been very instrumentally organized in the, um, in the administration of something called the Internationally Recognized Transit Corridor. And that's the modified convoy system that allows shipping to transit the Gulf of Aden region safely and not get attacked by pirates. How it works is you are given a time where you transit and you wait for a vessel to come and if you, if you, sorry, let me start again. You are given your time to, to transit and you go through, and as you leave at your appointed time, there will be a vessel within about 20 minutes of you at all points along the way. And that's enough time for you to resist a pirate attack and then, and then be rescued. And the implementation of that transit corridor has been absolutely crucial to the success of counter piracy. And this is one of the mechanisms which helps administer that transit corridor. As I've said before, it's very deeply non-hierarchical, and in fact, Early on, when people were trying to get China to participate in this, they actually said, no, we're not going to. And then it was sold to them as a basis, once it had been running for a while, look, we're not going to impose any particular rules of engagement on you. We're not going to tell you what to do. You can come and participate. The reason why it's very important to have as many players in the room as possible is because the amount of maritime space which is in play in Somali piracy is absolutely enormous. So the more ships you have, the better, because then you can cover a wider range of ocean. Yeah. Now, remember we talked about networks having exchanges, dense exchanges of information. So how counter piracy works is ships have to be able to tell each other when there is a hostile, a potential pirate ship on the horizon. And that might be at a great distance, and you might need people to respond quite quickly. Now, how do you do that when you have the Chinese cooperating with the Russians who are cooperating with the Indians and the Pakistanis and none of them necessarily like each other? What they came up with was they repurposed something called Mercury Chat. And what this is, I've got a little screenshot. It's like Instant Messenger. And it was a really useful, clever solution because it's something more secure than radio communications, which pirates might just be able to listen into but not as secure as it would be if you were trying to give the Chinese, say, secure communications. So it's a very good halfway house, and it's been integral to making this system work, is it allows these dense exchanges of information to happen in a way which doesn't create any hierarchy, in a way which doesn't create specific rules. It's a very innovative solution. So how have we seen this happen in counter piracy? What makes counter piracy different? The issue that I have, I think, when I explain this to people often, is that counter piracy is very unique. Piracy constitutes a very unique problem. And I think some of the reasons why we've been able to achieve a very unique form of cooperation is because of these very unique features of piracy. And I'll go through them in turn. So the first thing that I've mentioned this before is the size of the area in question. And this is, a, this is an old map, but it's a really good one because it shows you the limits. The largest of the circles is the furthest extent of pirate attack. 
and the smallest of the circles is where it started at the beginning. So you can see how the pirates began to extend their operations out and why you need so many ships to participate in counter piracy. This is a really, really vast area. So this is always going to be a situation of the more the merrier, the more vessels you have conducting counter piracy, the better the outcome that you're going to get. So that encourages people to be reasonably inclusive in developing how they're going to sort the problem out. And it facilitates, so remember we talked about dense exchanges of information. Dense exchanges of information to cover that whole area. We've seen a vessel at this particular juncture. We need someone to move. And it requires the confliction because you need to know what the other vessels are doing and how they're doing it in order to coordinate the whole picture. Also, the thing that's interesting about counter piracy is it's a, almost a, a deliberate blurring of hierarchies because in addition to all of those individual navies that I've mentioned, we have several different multinational groupings that are also involved in counter piracy. So we have NATO sends a contingent, EU NAV force sends a contingent, and we have um, from Combined Maritime Force in Bahrain, we have Combined Task Force 151 also sends a contingent. That last one involves about, I think it's about 26 different nations, including Pakistan, including Australia, including in the United States, and they work together on counter piracy. So if you have three multinational groupings and a bunch of states, quite deliberately, it's going to be very hard to have hierarchy. And so again, there's a conscious decision to avoid it. Piracy is also very unusual as an international security problem in that it has a very explicitly clear legal framework. So one of the other things that I'm looking at at the moment is illegal, unregulated, and unauthorized fishing, IUE fishing. That has a very complex legal framework. And the consequence of that, it's much harder to deal with as a problem. Whereas when Somali piracy first became an international problem of some significance, it was really, really easy to deal with it because it was a clear violation of international law. It was a clear violation of a very well accepted international law. And that facilitated UN Security Council support for counter piracy almost immediately. There was no quibbling around the margins about what was going on. So that's extremely helpful. And it's reasonably unusual, I think, in terms of a security problem. There's also no doubt that Somalia has quite significant strategic importance. And there are a lot of navies who would like to have an excuse to be sailing around the Gulf of Aden um, for a whole variety of different reasons. And most navies would probably be there anyway. So Australia, for example, would like to have a presence in the Gulf of Aden, regardless of whether or not counter piracy is ongoing. And the Chinese would like to have a presence, partly to demonstrate how far their navy has come and how far it can go. So there's all sorts of navies have a reason to be there anyway. Somalia also has specific strategic importance because of its location. So the reason why Somali piracy becomes such an issue is obviously when you're transiting the Suez Canal, it has a big impact on shipping if you're trying to avoid pirates. One of the things that tends to surprise people who don't know a lot about it, even at the height of Somali piracy, we're still talking about less than 1%, substantially less than 1% of the total shipping that was transiting the Suez Canal was being attacked by pirates. But the countermeasures that were being required to, for ships to avoid attack really slowed shipping down. And a significant chunk of the world's oil transits this reason, region. So this was a strategically important incidence of piracy. And that partly explains why so many states were interested in it. Piracy is a classic problem of the commons. Most high seas things are states are unable to sort it out individually. And we've seen that historically. So the Barbary pirates are the great 19th century example of piracy. And that was actually my picture with the legal frameworks. Um, that, that was the coast of what is now Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. And that was also solved by an international coalition. Partly, I think, because of the number of ships that it takes often to sort out a pirate problem. Yep, my next one. And there's also something, one of the other things which is unique about counter piracy probably has a little bit to do with the nature of navies and the nature of the maritime space. So navies have obviously historically been used to operating at a significant remove from national capitals and often without very speedy communication. So there's a historic tradition of navies cooperating with other navies and making decisions about how to solve problems on the high seas often because of technological constraints without the consultation of national capitals. There's a very strong, um, in a lot of the interview work I did, something that nearly everyone mentioned was that the maritime code, there's an idea that, that navies assist other navies when they experience problems. Navies are very like each other, so they're very easy to operate across services because they all operate in the same kind of domain and naval vessels are relatively feel relatively familiar across different types of navies. So there's a really 
strong impetus here and um, something that also came out in my interviews is a lot of people said, and not just people from Davies, said that um, you would, it would be very hard to imagine this sort of cooperation with armies, partly because also the numbers of people involved, right? So you're talking about a few vessels rather, rather than 20,000 troops. So there are lots of things that may be specific to navies which are facilitating this type of cooperation. And finally, I like to call this, this is a classic Goldilocks problem. It's just right for international cooperation. It's not such a big international security problem that national capitals are going to get really excited about how it has to be solved, nor is it so insignificant that you're never going to get a multinational response in the first place. So it hits a sweet spot in terms of being just serious enough for control, but not so serious that people are going to try to seize that control. So what does all of this mean? We have counterpiracy as a special case, and we have the specific form of cooperation that ensues. So we really reduce the need for repeated costly negotiations about what a contingent can and can't contribute. Shade is there to do that, and also because there are multiple chains of command and they're allowed to be multiple chains of command, people are allowed to work independently. And you can make as big of a contribution as you want, and that's going to be enough to be useful. And in this situation, caveats, which caused all of the problems in Afghanistan, are relatively unnecessary. And it solves some, it overcomes some of the problems of multinational military operations by being egalitarian informal and non-hierarchical. In, in other words, the exact reverse of what I said most people's conventional solution to the problems of military cooperation is. It also differs substantially from network theory expectations. So here's another, this is another human rights oriented map of network theory. One of the things that network theorists will tell you is the hubs, these are the organizing parts of the network, will often try and manipulate their power in the network to get more of what they want. And they might do that by blocking an exchange of information or by facilitating it for a preferred partner. What we find in counterpiracy is none of that happens, because if it did, the whole network wouldn't work. So this is something where states are actually very deliberately trying to be much more than the sum of their parts, and they're not manipulating the people who are the network hubs. So Shade is run out of CMF in Bahrain. They could try and manipulate that to become more powerful, but because it would damage the network as a whole, they largely don't. So this is an area where it differs quite sharply from the, what network theory tells us should happen. <clears throat> Here's my big challenge, though, and when I started working on this, is that is this just a completely unique problem? That all of those factors that I just told you about what makes piracy a special problem and explains why we have this very unusual form of cooperation to deal with it. And if that's true, that's no good for me because then I can't be telling people, well, here are some policy lessons that we might draw from it. The good news is I don't think it is a sui generis problem. We see this sort of very unusual cooperation in lots of other places, most specifically in instances of crime control, and particularly ones which involve the maritime. I'm going to come back to this idea a little bit later. This is the very blurry logo for something called the Joint Interagency Task Force South, which is based in Key West in the US. It's a big counter-narcotics organization. It's multi-agency and multinational. So they have anywhere between 15 and 20 different national contingents there at any one time. They have police forces, coast guards, and navies all working together. And they have very similar sorts of ideas. It's more hierarchical and permanent than counter piracy, but it still allows very independent contributions and, very, and facilitates relatively unusual forms of cooperation. Um, after the Asian tsunami, the Boxing Day tsunami of 2004, we saw a very similar innovative solution that was drawn up on the fly by navies themselves coming up with cunning solutions to problems to deliver aid. And again, it was also involved multiple navies who weren't necessarily obvious partners who were working together to solve a specific and concrete problem. During the first Gulf War, there's something called the C3IC, which is can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it was, uh, it was a command and control, coordination command and control site that was meant to facilitate the cooperation between so many partners in the coalition in the first Gulf War. This is a less good example. It was a bit of a fig leaf to make certain national contingents feel better about participating in a multinational action under US command, but it nonetheless shows that, that sometimes we do improvise unusual, non-specifically hierarchical forms of military command. 
So what does this tell us about where we might see this type of cooperation? Well, I think we'll see it with our Goldilocks problems. So we'll see it where problems are just serious enough where they require our attention. We'll see it where we need an extremely broad coalition. And as soon as you have an extremely broad coalition, that's probably not so likely to tolerate a unified command. And I think it's really important to say what I'm not saying here is I don't think this is a model for how you would actually fight a war on the ground. Right? This would not work if you tried to use it as in any kind of war against a sophisticated adversary. It works against Somali pirates, and it probably wouldn't work in other contexts. Interestingly, in the narcotics context, what you see is narcotics started out is exactly this sort of Goldilocks problem. This is something that we need to do. But as the crime control developed, there is a very interesting sort of co-evolution into more and more complex forms of counter-narcotics and more and more elaborate forms of control. And that's something else I look at in other areas of my research, and I'll come back to that a little bit. So I think that maybe we should see this kind of cooperation more. And I think part of the reason why it's very important to study it and to think about how it works is there are lots of contexts where it does apply and maybe we should think about using it. So here's another picture. This is a change of command at Jayat of South. Um, can we have the next one? And part of the reason why I throw out this uh, example of counter-narcotics is if you look at Australia's current naval operations, what you find is the ones which are not in support of land operations, the ones that are specific to Navy. Um, oh, I forgot to write down the name. There are two. Is anybody? I can't remember. Manabu, is that right? Manitou, that's the one. This is Manitou. <laughs> and um, this supports, this basically supports combined maritime force. And at the moment, Australia has HMAS Darwin, which is tasked to combine maritime force in Bahrain. So, that's part of what Australia does. And the other one is Operation Resolute. And this one is really interesting. Those are all the things that Operation Resolute is meant to do down the side there. All of those things are effectively crime or explicitly crime. They're all also things that it's hard to imagine that you could have an effective unilateral solution to any of those problems. Right? These are all things that involve multiple nations, a problem which happens at the high seas. They're also all inherently probably involving multiple types of agency, because many of them are criminal. So when we are trying to control things like illegal maritime arrivals, maritime terrorism, illegal fishing, illegal exploitation of natural resources, maybe we should think about what was done in counter piracy as a really interesting model for how to control these problems. I think some of them, like IUU fishing, I think IUU fishing should be a Goldilocks problem, illegal fishing, but it largely isn't because I think people underestimate its seriousness often. It's hard to sell to people as a very important problem. But maybe if we applied some of these very unusual, non-hierarchical, multi-agency, multinational approaches to these problems, we would see them also reduce. Um, and it would be a very innovative form of cooperation to begin to actually think about deliberately applying these rather than letting them spontaneously erupt in response to crisis, which has typically been what's happened. The other, and I think this relates to my point about how do you counter crime in general without a network, and this is a picture of one of the organizations Sea Shepherd targeted these six naughty IUU fishing vessels called the Bandit Six, and they were incorrigible. They had been illegally fishing Patagonian toothfish for upwards of 10 years, and no one had managed to catch them. And what Sea Shepherd did is they basically organized one of their very effective vigilante campaigns and said, well, we will just follow these vessels, all six of them, until they are either able to be apprehended by, the, by appropriate authorities or they give up. And within 16 months, all six of them had been brought to justice when previously it had taken 10 to 15 years. How were they able to do that? Well, they have a um, looser interpretation of the law than, than, a, than a legal organization would, and that's part of it. But it's also because they actually also have a networked form. And they were able to create this very interesting national authorities were working with the Sea Shepherds to do this. And people were keeping each other apprised of where the movements were. And in fact, it created a little mini network to solve this problem. And it stopped these six vessels from carrying on. Um, cooperating on crime is also easy for states. States like to cooperate on crime because most states agree that crime is bad. And therefore, it could be a really useful starting point for other things. So there's very few states in the world that don't have some sort of counter-narcotics policy, that don't have some sort of counter-illegal migration policy, that don't have some sort of policy that says we would prefer it if people did not illegally fish our waters. So if you have those common interests in the first place, maybe what you could do is cooperate on them and use it to make connections between navies. And the reason why I think that is quite important 
is because we have very few, I think most people's doomsday scenario with the South China Sea, which is here, this is, I found this, this is on the internet, this is how the US would fight a naval battle in the South China Sea where the fleets would come. And most people you talk to, their doomsday scenario in the South China Sea isn't an out, full-on, head-to-head confrontation. It's a mistake that goes wrong. So somebody misinterprets somebody else, and what happens is that escalates and escalates and escalates, and all of a sudden, then you potentially have naval war in the South China Sea. Now, I'm not trying to make too many claims for what the sort of cooperation that I've been talking about can do, but I think it's not entirely far-fetched to say, look, if people have familiarity operating with each other in countering piracy or encountering other sorts of crimes, if they actually know each other, which in many cases they will, they might have met while they're doing some of these operations, if they have an unusual communication system that they both know how to access, maybe that would actually be a very good starting point to reduce the potential of sort of catastrophic mistake from occurring in the South China Sea. So it's not a perfect solution, but I think in some ways it's as best as we're going to get given that we're dealing with states that are actually quite hostile to each other and a situation which has a great deal of security sensitivity. So that takes me to the end of what I wanted to talk about. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, just a quick question about the involvement of the Chinese mm. and how they were actually brought on. I mean, I'm, this is a subject I'm quite interested mm. in. Could you uh, expand a little bit on that? Well, what, happens, what happened in the early stages of counter-piracy is they developed something called the contact, group on Somali, the contact Group on Piracy, and it had lots of different components, and it still exists. So there was a legal component, there was a naval, there was a naval interdiction component, there was a civil society building component. And most nations saw piracy as a problem they wanted to stop, so they got involved. Piracy was authorized by, like I said earlier, a Security Council resolution. And the Chinese were interested in participating in counter-piracy. But counter-piracy, it's going to be a very complicated answer, unfortunately. Piracy started out as a reasonably serious problem. It got people's attention. States tried to do something about it. And the first attempts at state controlling counter-piracy actually, states controlling piracy actually backfired for a whole lot of different reasons. And piracy was getting bigger and bigger and bigger at the same time you had this multinational response. So it was clear that something more concrete and coherent needed to be done. And that's when you start getting to the development of the contact group and shade begins to grow out of that. Again, as a spontaneous response, not as something particularly planned. And the initial grouping of states that were involved in shade was quite small. And then other states who were operating in the region began to participate more and more. And the Chinese were invited, is my understanding, at early stages and said no, that they did not want to be involved in a multinational grouping. And then eventually, as they saw how well it was working, were persuaded that it was a good idea. Um, Sarah, I just wanted to test one of your underlying assumptions, mm. and that is that the uh, coalition forces in the Persian, in the, um, against piracy mm. actually achieved anything. Okay, yeah. Um, as you know, many people would argue that, in fact, they achieved nothing mm. and that the uh, decline in piracy was all due to um, ships taking self-defence yeah. measures. And so if you look at it that way, are these anti-piracy operations more actually a political or strategic um, function, have mm. a political or strategic function rather than a practical function of being anti-piracy. Yeah. I don't know what that would do to yeah. your theory. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't buy it, okay? So I think part of what I said before is, remember how I said we have this modified convoy system and how it works is that once you're transiting in the internationally recognized transit corridor, you are about 20 minutes away from a vessel. Part of the reason why it works to be 20 minutes away is because states adopted a number of things which they call best management practices. And some of them were very simple, like putting barbed wire along, um, along a low-lying ship to make it harder for the pirates to get on board, or the use of water cannons. Some ships were using private security guards. Um, there are a number of things that, that made it actually harder for the pirates to get on board the ship. Um, there is no doubt that, that best management practices has had a significant impact, but I think only in conjunction with um, with the IRTC and with the presence of navies as a deterrent. Because a lot of these measures are enough to resist pirate attack for about 20 minutes. 
and no more than that. The other thing is there's a huge number of ship owners that still haven't taken any best management practice measures because there's no incentive for them to do it. When we, when we talk about the fact that it's less than 1% of shipping, which is transiting the region, is getting caught, and your insurance premiums were still not massively expensive, you didn't care whether or not your crew got taken hostage, and a lot of ship owners don't care whether or not their crew members get taken hostage. You know you're gonna get the insurance payout in the first place. And so they were unwilling to spend the money to get the more effective forms of management practice. So people often ask me, because it ties together my bits of research nicely, what about private security on ships? And the answer to that is rich companies who care about their cargo or care about their crew will be using private security guards. But they are also the sort of ships who are going to be taking all the necessary precautions anyway because they are well off and because they care. And it's not to explain the large numbers of ships who don't. So those ones, this is a classic, it's, a, it's the lighthouse, it's the classic um, public good problem, is that everybody is benefiting from the system. But I think there's no doubt if the navies went away, the pirates would just go back to business. We know they're in, busily involved in smuggling all sorts of other things at the moment. They've, they've just transferred, they haven't shut down operations, they've just stopped pirating. Where I think you can be critical of counter-piracy for not working is exactly that, right? The pirates have not gone anywhere. This is a solution which is being applied it would be like if Canberra suddenly had a very, very devastating criminal problem occurring in the city center, and the solution to it was just to contain it in the city center so the criminals never went in or out. That solution will only last as long as the containment policy is there, and as soon as it goes away, everybody's just gonna come out again. And I think that's the case with counter piracy, that the lasting solution is obviously going to be an on the ground in Somalia solution. But that is obviously, because we're talking about Somalia, probably a generation away from being possible to implement. So it's very, very costly. That's the other thing. So I have a slide that I don't have in this deck, but I have other ways about the total cost of counter piracy, and it's immense. So is it really worth spending so much money on this problem in perpetuity if we think that it would just resurge if? if uh, the navies went away. I don't think it would be as severe as it was in 2008 and 2009 because of the best management practices, but I think it would come back. Um, you're talking about uh, illegal fishing. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, the Somalis said that they're pirating because mm -hmm. the illegal fishers, they had to do something. Mm -hmm. and the fastest way of making a million dollars was to take a crew. Yeah. Uh, even two weeks ago, they were writing another articles written saying, um, we would be doing the similar sort of thing. You know, we've now got the naval ship. So mm. Five years ago, people said, yeah. how can we stop it? What they did is, let's just stop all those boats coming yeah. off the shore, which meant that not only did the illegals uh, were being stopped coming off, so were the legals. So now they mm. could not fish in their own water. Yeah. The article from two weeks ago is saying, now we're actually, we can't get off the shore unless we leave after dawn and are back before dark, mm. which fishing people don't want to do. Mm. We can see the illegal fishing boats out there, but if we actually go out, we will get, our boats will be run down by the local navies because they've got their light vessels running inshore. Yeah, so this is in Somalia. Yeah, this yeah. is in Somalia. Um, <clears throat> wouldn't it just be cheaper to monitor the illegal fishing fleets, monitor the illegal motherships, get rid of the motherships that are, that are the basis for these illegal fishers, and then the guys would be actually be able to go out and fish again. Well, it depends on whether or not you believe the Somali pirates. And a lot of people don't believe the Somali pirates. So there's been a lot of interesting work done on this. And one of the big problems with it is the pirate hotspot in Putland was not traditionally a fishing community. People were not actually fishing very much at all. And if you look at where the ships they started attacking, they weren't actually fishing vessels at all. They sort of moved straight away to oil tankers. So it's a, it's a complex story. And most people who know the region well, there is at minimum, a very high degree of skepticism as to whether or not that is actually what started Somali piracy. There is a competing and I think a largely better theory, which has been um, by some anthropologists who've actually done a lot of field work in the region for a very long time. Very dangerous. I don't think my university would ensure me to, uh, <laughs> to go in the region. But there is a, in that part of Putland in particular, which is the real pirate heartland, there's a strong tradition of paying tribute to transit the area. And that was true on land and at sea. So what we actually see isn't anything to do with illegal fishing. It's just an increasingly sophisticated application of a tribute system which had existed for a long time. And that tribute system is still in place for smaller fishing dows and still causes problems. But it's not the same thing as saying illegal fishing caused Somali pirates to go off and become pirates. But can't the fleet stop these illegals? Which, who? Stop? 
stop the illegal fishing vessels. Well, can't the navies do that, you mean? The problem is, is that one of the many problems, illegal fishing is a whole separate, maybe you can have me back to come talk about illegal fishing, it's a whole separate problem, not least because it's very hard to distinguish between a vessel which may be fishing legally and a vessel which is fishing illegally. And that's not what they're mandated to do. And it wouldn't solve the pirate problem because the pirates are totally disconnected from illegal fishing. So would it be better for us not to have illegal fishing? Probably. Is this big multinational naval operation the way to stop illegal fishing? Probably not. Thank you for the, the good example of, of international cooperation. Something I'm interested in is applying the same sort of approach to international cooperation against things like um, anti-money laundering mm -hmm. and um, counter-terrorism finance. Do you see the analogies across there? Um, and it, could that also be a similar Goldilocks problem? Yeah. Um, I think, if anything, it's probably a more severe problem, particularly when when states are very exercised about terrorism questions. What definitely in terms of networked solutions for cooperation, because it's very similar, not least because um, money laundering is one of these examples of where people have applied network theory to how it works. It's a classic network. Money laundering systems are classic examples of networks because they're, they're, they rely on communications of information and they're non-hierarchical and it all moves around. So yes, both in terms of its actual subject matter and in terms of the fact that you need multinational, multi-agency responses to make it end. What I think is interesting is that we don't seem to have seized on as much as we could all of these innovative solutions which respond to a specific problem and then said, well, you know, if this specific problem can be solved in this way, could we think more specifically and more generally about how it might be applied? Um, thank you. I was just curious about sort of the scope of what's discussed on the, I think it was the Mercury system that you were mm -hmm. talking about between yeah. the navies, particularly when you gave it, roughly speaking, as an example of something that could help in a catastrophic yeah. accident yeah. type situation. Um, how how free is the communication and what sort of, how broad is the scope of what's discussed? Well, in the context of counter piracy, it was mainly about, we've spotted this vessel, it's moving at this speed, it's at these coordinates, keep an eye out for it. Which is obviously not something you want to broadcast on the radio because the pirates were low tech but not stupid. So you know, if they'd heard it, they would have just gone out. It just relies on regular communications technology. So it's not encrypted and you wouldn't pass very, very secure things over it. But it's a really important halfway house solution between radio and complete security, which you're never going to get. But because it's relatively easy and we know it's worked in, the, in that context, we know it could work because all vessels are, have computers on them and they're equipped to do this. So it could apply. You would never use it for something very secure because it's secure from the pirates, but it's not, you know, not secure from a, some sort of more sophisticated adversary. You were talking about how uh, countries can come together to tackle the problem, especially in the commons that are you mm. know, uh, international waters. But uh, if we have piracy in uh, territorial waters, mm. that is still very important to global trade. Mm. Uh, and questions of sovereignty come up and uh, get in mm. the way. How would we go about uh, dealing with that? Like, How do you see that as being a potential issue, especially in regions like Southeast Asia, yeah. where there is no uh, sort of international waters. It's very territorial yeah. base. Yeah. So how do you see that? Well, the cheating answer is that it's not piracy if it happens within territorial waters. It's sea robbery. That's the cheating answer. <laughs> the, uh, and actually, this, this was an issue in Somalia. And the one thing that the Security Council was able to provide was to say, actually, we count this as piracy, even though it's happening in Somali territorial waters, because we know Somalia has no capacity to police its own ter territorial waters. So the counter piracy could pursue vessels within territorial waters. Actually, though, we've had a really good example, which I didn't talk about tonight, of an earlier multinational counter-piracy cooperation, which is between Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia controlling piracy, um, which was partly set up deliberately around this problem, was that in ways you need more coordination if you're going to have to be constantly transiting each other's territorial waters than you do if the problem is primarily occurring on the high seas. It's one of these fine legal distinctions which has important consequences, because the other thing is some states Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia will tell you they've been very successful on counter-piracy. Some people who are very skeptical say, well, no, they're just not counting it 
as piracy anymore. It's still happening. It's just they've conveniently shelved it into the sea robbery category. I don't think it's happening with the same depth and persistence it was when it was a more significant problem in the late 90s and early 2000s, though. I'm, I'm just curious um, with your comment about it being a Goldilocks problem. Mm. And for now, it seems sort of serious enough, but mm. not too serious to be solved. But that point that you made that the underlying causes aren't being addressed, mm. and perhaps at the same time, there are trends that could worsen it in the future if people backed off, for example, you know, cutting off um, money transfers back to Somalia from the yeah. diaspora or people pushing from refugee camps back into Somalia from Kenya with a wave of anti sort of Somali feeling. So I'm just wondering, how long do you think it will be a Goldilocks problem? And if and when they decide to sort of back off and it's not worth that investment, mm. will we see that spike from all those other factors? Yeah, and I mean, I, I remain very concerned that Somali piracy will become a problem again. That's not just academic wishful thinking because I'm disappointed that they've calmed down <laughs> and I write about them. But I think actually it is a potentially very serious problem. And it's partly because even the things they tried in the context of civil society building or figuring out how to build local capacity backfired. So we were talking in another session this afternoon that various people tried to give the authorities and put them ships so they could enforce the pirate problem themselves. And what happened was the pirates were suddenly seen sailing around in these really much better vessels than the one that they had before. So it's a classic, that area is a classic state building problem generally. It's phenomenally corrupt. And that means that it's very difficult to give aid in such a way that it's going to develop into a more stable system. There are all sorts of interesting things that we know also about the origin of the Somali pirates and the fact that a lot of them had come in from the country and they sort of did your one big score and then you went back out and took your money with you. Um, and the simple fact of the matter for Somalis as well is this wasn't a problem that preyed on insiders, it's a problem that preys on outsiders. And we know from other crime control contexts that that's really hard to control. One of the best ways to control a big criminal problem is to have the community get really annoyed about it and then stamp it out. But if it's all outsiders and you're getting this big source of income that you're not getting any other way, it's very desirable. And I don't think that desire to keep doing it is going to go away. I think some of the stuff we've talked about with making ships harder to attack will actually help quite a lot. But one of the things that pirates are doing is smuggling charcoal. So acacia, you burn acacia to get charcoal in Somalia and Yemen. And Yemen has had a reasonably significant deforestation problem because they're burning, they're burning down the charcoal and they're, they're smuggling it in and out and the pirates are using the same vessels and the same things that they were doing. So they've just switched crime. Um, I think that it's not for a lack of will, though. I don't think people have said, oh, yeah, we, we're just going to stick this maritime band-aid on the Somali pirate problem. It's actually just really, really hard to institute the the correct sort of solutions that are going to get you a right outcome in somewhere like Somalia. Yes, I'd like to draw your attention to the notorious uh, 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 water uh, that is the uh, Sulu Sea, mm -hmm. and that is the border between East Malaysia, mm -hmm. Sabah, yeah. and uh, the Southern Philippines. Yes. Particularly the, uh, the Sulu Aji Pilago. Mm -hmm. Now, before I ask the question, I'd like to draw your attention that according to the Indonesian Foreign Ministry, more than 100,000 ships sailed through Sulu Sea last year mm -hmm. and uh, carrying about 60 million tons mm -hmm. of cargo and more than 18 million passengers. Mm -hmm. So it's quite significant to Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines. Yeah. And uh, the bad news is uh, there was a series of uh, kidnaps, kidnappings over the past months, mm -hmm. uh, including 14 Indonesians and four Malaysian sailors yeah. uh, in the eastern Sabah by gunmen uh, linked to the Abu Soyo group yeah. in the southern Philippines. So that become a uh, Sort of initially, is an issue kidnapping of tourists, kidnapping of uh, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, fish farming operators, mm -hmm. or even the seaweed operator from East Malaysia into uh, the Sulu archipelago, mm -hmm. yeah. such as Dawi Dawi, uh, Horo, and the Basare, and even uh, part of uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Mindanao Islands. Uh, unfortunately, that is a concentration of the 
uh, Islamic area, yeah. and they may have connection with the Middle East. Yeah. Because the practice, the decapitalization, the seeking of ransom, we're talking about ransom of millions and millions yeah. of dollars. That become a sort of a, a interesting issue, and also a very sort of a, a bit alarm bell yeah. being rang, yeah. because Indonesia already dragged into that yeah. issue. Yeah. Now, my question is, um, to my understanding, the region, uh, the Sulu archipelago, has been a very underdeveloped uh, mm -hmm. region. There is a lot of poverty. Mm -hmm. And initially, it's a problem within Philippines. Mm -hmm. But the problem expands yes. across the border. Yeah. My uh, question is, do you think uh, multinational uh, country to help to develop the underdeveloped region of Sulu Archipelago yeah. will be able to stop uh, the, uh, the kidnapping for ransom yeah. and the piracy in the Sulu area, yeah. rather than resort so, to uh, the uh, multinational navies. navies As you yeah. just pointed out, it's very, very expensive. Yes, it is very expensive. Yeah. I think that, look, that area that when I was talking about um, that area has always been a pirate hotspot, and I normally have a map in front of my slides where I show, but it, it's a great place to be a pirate throughout, throughout the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea because it's really, people have to come really close to land, and that means you don't have to be very sophisticated in your methods if you're going to be doing any kind of crime, and so it's very desirable. Part of what you describe is related to this problem that I've just mentioned of how people are classifying it. So people are choosing not to report these as instances of piracy because that would damage their reputation as having successfully stamped out the pirate problem. And as you point out, this is also a political problem. No doubt that piracy is partially a function of poverty and that if you can give people a better way of making a livelihood, they kidnap and ransom, most people will probably take that. But that is an enormously <coughs> complex, so naval stuff is expensive. Solving world poverty has a ridiculously long time horizon and is also very expensive. So it's, it's, it's one of these not easy policy solutions. But yes, you're right, if we could eradicate world poverty, we would see fewer instances of piracy and fewer instances of all sorts of crime, actually. Thanks, Dr. Percy, very interesting. Um, just two very brief questions. Um, piracy being a civil maritime security threat, I'm just wondering how you felt about or your, your thoughts on Coast Guard versus navies, which is the yeah. best tool for that, that civil maritime security problem. Yeah. And just a very quick second one, there's been a couple of reports on cyber attacks on shipping, um, mm. shipping companies lately in terms of pirates, if you like, targeting specific cargoes, yeah. etc. What are your um, <clears throat> views on that? Is it an increasing problem? Or, yeah, so to take the, the, the shipping one first, is this with the, with the AIS system, the vessel tracking system? So for people who aren't necessarily familiar with shipping, all ships travel with a transponder, which basically gives their, gives their position at any time. And when I first started working on this, I would ask people from the International Maritime Bureau, doesn't that, don't you find that worrying? <laughs> that people would actually know where your ship is at all times? And there are, there are other important safety reasons to have it, but yes, I think it's vulnerable. I'm not aware of any particularly heightened form of attack which is happening now, but I think it's a known vulnerability, and knowing, being able to know where a particular cargo is going is particularly important. One of the things that differs about South China Sea piracy as compared to Somali piracy, South China Sea piracy was largely about stealing the cargo. Um, so having a valuable cargo or a certain type of small portable cargo, knowing that is really valuable. Somalia just doesn't have the infrastructure to steal cargo, and that's why they did kidnap and ransom. Because it would get into Somalia, there were no roads, there were no air, you couldn't move what you'd taken. So that's why you got kidnapped and ransom. So it doesn't surprise me that this is a tactic, because if that's your form of piracy, it really helps to know that you've got a ship carrying a whole lot of iPads, because that they're small, you can move them, you can shift them, you can make money more quickly. 